Hi, everyone. I'm Megan Joyce Tozer, a board member at the nonprofit Stop Sexual Assault in Schools. I'm here interviewing two fellows with public justice who work on the Student Civil Rights Project, Sheriff Khan and Molly Berkowitz. Thank you both for being here with me. As we get started, would you mind introducing yourselves and telling us a little bit about your personal involvement in public justice's Student Civil Rights Project? Sure. So um, like Megan said, my name is Molly Berkowitz, and I've been an attorney at Public Justice for two years. Um, in my role at Public Justice, I work exclusively on the Student Civil Rights Project. So that means I get to work on lawsuits brought by students um, at all levels of courts. That's everything from the trial court at the federal level up through the U.S. Supreme Court and some work in the state level, too. Um, during my time here, I've had a chance to help negotiate settlements on behalf of uh, students at all different levels. And along the way, we've won some really great opinions that have helped to shift the law, too. And I'm Sheriff Hull. I'm starting my second year on the Fellowship of Public Justice. I'm also exclusively working with the Students of Rights Project. Um, during my time with the project, I've worked on briefs, helped tackle cutting edge issues in civil rights law, and worked with really incredible clients. So in my own time, I guess a big, a big highlight of my time at public justice has been working on a forthcoming law review article on the meaning of federal financial assistance. And that is an issue that matters because two statutes that we litigate under, Title IX and Title VI, um, use that term to define what they apply to. So for uh, only institutions that accept federal financial assistance have Title IX and Title VI applied to them. Along those lines, I mean, you mentioned holding private schools accountable. Um, what are some of the other goals, broadly speaking, of the Student Civil Rights Project? Um, it seems like it has a unique approach to combating all different forms of discrimination in schools. Um, could you speak to some of the specific goals? Sure, I'm happy to do that. So the Student Civil Rights Project combines high impact cutting edge litigation with other advocacy tools to combat harassment and other forms of discrimination in schools. So we strive to create systemic change so that all students can learn and, and thrive free from discrimination in schools. On the practical level, this means that we um, often file lawsuits on behalf of students. This might mean filing a lawsuit on behalf of just one student who attends, for example, a large school district with the aim of securing change across that district that will benefit all of the students in the district, not just the one individual who we represent. So by way of example, we recently settled one such case that we brought on behalf of Kamika Shelby. Kamika Shelby is the mother of Nigel Shelby. Um, Nigel was a 15-year-old Black gay student at Huntsville High School in Huntsville, Alabama in 2019. Unfortunately, as a student there, Nigel experienced unrelenting anti-gay harassment by his peers. When Nigel and a classmate went to the school principal to report such harassment, the principal basically laughed them off, brushed them aside, and responded only with hostility and racism. One week after that report, Nigel died by suicide. Earlier this year, we settled the case. The settlement means that, um, or because of the settlement, the school must provide anti-harassment training to all of its school staff. That, that means training to ensure that school staff know how to recognize harassment and know what to do once they receive a report so that people aren't treated like Nigel was by that school administrator. In addition, the school has to change its policy to make clear that anti-gay harassment is a form of harassment that is prohibited under the school's existing policy. That's just a taste of the things that we've negotiated, but I won't give you the whole laundry list here. Um, now these changes will benefit the 20,000 current students at Huntsville City Schools, as well as the generations of students to come um, in that large school district. In addition to taking on these types of cases, we also take on appeals or other cases on behalf of a single student that have the potential to shift the law so that it might be more protective of students all around the country. So one example of this is that um, one of our colleagues, Alexandra Brodsky, recently argued a, um, an appeal in the Ninth Circuit, which is a federal court in California, Arizona, out west, um, where she argued on behalf of Mackenzie Brown. Mackenzie brought a case against the University of Arizona after she experienced really severe dating violence um, and was nearly killed by a classmate who she was dating at the time. The university knew that um, this classmate who was on the university's football team had abused two other women who he was dating, but didn't take action to bar him from the university or to protect students like Mackenzie from him. Um, when Mackenzie brought suit, the university argued that um, because the harassment, the abuse by this football player took place at a house off campus, but near campus, 
the university couldn't be liable. It was out of bounds. Um, I'm happy to report that earlier this week, the Ninth Circuit ruled for McKenzie, holding that, of course, Title IX can reach off campus where there's two students and the school has substantial control over the, the events at issue. So this means that not only at the University of Arizona, but across the country now, schools are on notice that when there's abuse between students off campus, it impacts the student's education, the school needs to take action. In addition to these types of lawsuits, we also participate in other forms of um, advocacy, such as working on legislative changes, um, creating Know Your Rights materials and giving presentations to uh, community members, families of, of children in schools, and working with other organizations that do legal advocacy and um, non-legal advocacy and activism around these issues. Wow, that is such crucial and you know, broad work. Um, thank you for explaining all that. You know, I'm also, you mentioned a few specific cases. I also wanted to highlight what I noticed um, was a, a list, a compilation that the Student Civil Rights Project puts out twice a year, a compilation of all of the verdicts and settlements um, related to K through 12 sexual harassment and bullying cases, um, harassment generally. And I think that's a great resource. I think it's just demonstrative of all, um, all how common this is and all of the cases, um, in addition to the ones that you mentioned. Um, and also all of the attorneys who are, who are working around the country on this type of, of issue. So I wondered if you could speak to your own motivations um, as attorneys and also the other um, attorneys who are, who are fellows or who are working on specific cases and what, what brought them and yourselves to the Student Civil Rights Project? What, what motivates you and the, the reasons you want to help? Yeah, I, I can start off here and then Molly can join me at the end. So our team is made up of five attorneys, our director, Adele, two staff attorneys, Alexandra and Sean, and us, the two really incredible fellows. Um, and we're all drawn to this work for, I think, very different reasons. But I can say fairly confidently that we all have very intense personal ties to the work that we, we do. The issues that students face on a daily basis are things that we know quite intensely as former students. Um, we know what discrimination, what harassment and abuse look like in and outside the classroom. And we know how much more has to be done to make sure that schools take these issues seriously. So for myself, I grew up in a really low income immigrant community in Queens, New York. And I, I am who I am today because I received a safe education and because I could pursue the things that I wanted to without fear of being harassed or discriminated against on the basis of my skin or, or anything else about my background. But I know so many others who were discriminated against or who were afraid to go to school because of bullying, harassment, so many other things. And that made school a particularly stressful place to be. And those are the same students who are likely to stop coming into classes often who have lower GPAs because they have a harder time focusing in the classroom. Uh, and sometimes those are the kids like our client, Nigel Shelby, like Molly just mentioned, who died by suicide. And so recognizing that those issues are big parts of, and big challenges in students' lives is I think a pretty important part of all our passions when it comes to our work. And for me personally, I see discrimination as a major killer of opportunity. So. I understand our work to be just as much about economic justice and social mobility as much as it is about pure civil rights. And Molly will tell you a little bit about her motivations too. Yeah, like Sheriff said, I think one thing that binds all of us is that we've all had experiences with education. For myself, I went to a, a very, very small public school system in Pennsylvania. And when I was in high school, um, a news story broke about sexual abuse that was happening in my own high school. Like I said, really small school, fewer than 200 students. We all knew all of the administrators very well. And it came out that a vice principal who I knew personally was sexually abusing a disabled classmate of mine um, over a period of years at school. That at the time, you know, when I was 17 years old was a seismic shock to my world. And it um, kind of set me on the road that I, uh, to become the lawyer I am today. Like you were saying, Megan, now I know that that kind of abuse is all too common. Um, and that it's taking place in schools across the country. But I'm glad to know that um, as an attorney here with SCRP, I can do something about it. And that the other attorneys I work with who I adore and think are brilliant are working hard on these issues, as are many other um, just absolutely amazing advocates at our partner organizations that we um, get to routinely work with. So that at least gives me some hope. 
Absolutely. I also find hope in how many people are motivated by their personal histories and their communities to work on this type of tricky issue. I, I too was brought to activism because of my past. And um, I think as, um, as leaders in that way, we can really make change. It's heartening to hear about the work that you're doing. Thank you um, for sharing the details. Um, and we know, and uh, most listeners and viewers will understand the social and cultural hurdles that it comes to um, when it comes to sexual harassment. But when students are faced with sexual harassment on their campus, what are some of the, the toughest legal obstacles that they can expect to face? Yeah, there are plenty. And so I'll, I'll, I'll give a quick, quick uh, overview of a couple. So unfortunately, like you mentioned, Megan, uh, victims of sexual harassment face a lot of obstacles, both at school and through the legal system. So for example, a big one is that the Trump administration's, uh, you know, had these Title IX regulations that limited school's ability and responsibility to protect survivors. And those have yet to be, be repealed. And so those are still in schools today and they affect the ability of um, survivors to actually report and get um, get protection after, after they have been harassed or discriminated against. At the same time, there's a serious lack of adequate Title IX training at most uh, K-12 schools. So administrators, faculty, and other staff who oftentimes are very well-meaning don't understand how to recognize sexual harassment when it occurs or how to address it. And that's a big deal. There's another big issue that I think uh, a lot of us have been seeing in, in the world in the past couple of years, which is the backlash against the Me Too movement. So a lot of students accused of sexual harassment have started retaliating against the students who have actually reported them. So sometimes that involves uh, defamation suits. Uh, sometimes it involves the accused student filing their own Title IX complaint against the student who reported them in the first place. And those are obstacles that together have a really big chilling effect on reporting because students fear that their school either won't be able or willing to help them even if they report, or if they report that they might in turn be um, retaliated against. On top of that, there is a recent Supreme Court decision that seems to have limited the ability of individuals to recover damages in Title IX suits for emotional harm, um, which is oftentimes in these cases, the main kind of damage or main kind of harm that students face. So that's really troubling because while money can never obviously fix the harm that a school's failure to respond to sexual discrimination causes or the harm of sex-based discrimination itself, it is one of the few and key legal remedies that our legal system provides. So for years, survivors of discrimination have been able to recover damages for the emotional distress that a school's actions or, or lack of action caused them. But now we've seen a marked decrease in the number of Title IX lawsuits brought because it just isn't financially viable for these lawsuits to be brought by attorneys, by the clients who have to put themselves through hours and days and weeks and months of you know, sitting through testimony and depositions and recounting every fact over and over again in, in, in multiple emotional encounters. So because of all those things, it just means that victims are not able to get um, the damages that, that they're seeking. And so it ends up being the case that these lawsuits aren't really being brought. So those are, those are just a couple of the, the big legal obstacles that are in our way these days. Thank you for describing them all. And with all that in mind, it's understandable why it could be really daunting for students and their parents to decide to engage an attorney. We know that um, the Student Civil Rights Project with Public Justice uh, is engaging or employing amazing attorneys. The work you're doing um, is, is changing the world and changing um, the landscape for the future. But with the current landscape, if people are listening and feeling hesitant to hire someone to represent them, do you have any recommendations for how folks can advocate for themselves? Sure. Like you said, it is a challenging landscape out there. Um, there's no denying it. But with that said, victims of sexual harassment can always report to their school. So um, if someone's considering doing that, they should look at their school's policy and, and see who the appropriate person to report to is. That will vary, but often it's a Title IX coordinator. Now, all schools that receive any federal funding must have a Title IX coordinator under current regulations. The job of the Title IX coordinator is to um, ensure that the school complies with Title IX. 
Now, um, the person to report to won't always be the Title IX coordinator, but it often is. And for anyone, it's a good idea to look at your school's policy, victim or not, and just know who that Title IX coordinator is. Now, uh, once a victim makes a report, the school is supposed to investigate and take steps to ensure that the victim is able to continue accessing their education without a problem. What this looks like in terms of ensuring a victim's access is going to vary a lot. Um, a second grader is going to face different issues than someone in college, obviously. So it's hard to say exactly what a school must do. It's, it's not exactly prescribed in that way. But some examples of things that we've seen in the past are, for example, um, changing class schedules so that a victim doesn't have to be in class with the person who harassed them. Um, schools can assign someone to be an escort for a victim so that they can safely travel between classes without a problem or without having to interact with their harasser. Um, schools can also provide a safe space for a victim if they need somewhere where they can just go and have like a quiet moment or a counselor who's on call to talk to this person who knows what's happened. Um, and most of all, schools should allow victims the opportunity to either make up classwork or get extensions on classwork if their schoolwork has been impacted by the harassment. Um, of course, it's important to note that not all schools will follow through on their obligations under Title IX, um, but when a school doesn't follow the law, survivors have options, even outside of hiring an attorney. So without an attorney, a survivor can still file a complaint with the Federal Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights, also known as OCR. There are also state equivalents to OCR where survivors can file complaints if they think that their school hasn't complied with the law. One caveat to this is that um, the res resolution process for these complaints can be quite um, long and it can take years. But with that said, this can be a, a way for, for survivors to make really impactful change um, without needing to hire an attorney. Now, with that said, survivors are always welcome to reach out to Public Justice's Student Civil Rights Project. And even if we can't assist you ourselves, we're happy to um, send other resources and hopefully identify someone who might be able to assist. Thank you for explaining all that. I, it's so good to know that there are a lot of different venues that despite the daunting um, landscape that you face, if you are the victim of sexual harassment at school, um, or if it is impacting your education, there are organizations like Public Justice that have programs like the Student Civil Rights Project with all of these talented and skilled and informed and really deeply personally motivated attorneys who are working on this. So thank you for sharing your time and your expertise. Um, is there anything else that you would like to add before we wrap up our talk? I don't think so, but um, thank you for having us. It's been great to chat with you, Megan. I'm here. Really great to talk to you. Thank you both so much. I appreciate it. I'm going to stop recording.